Welcome to the Multifamily Investor Nation podcast. I'm your host, Whitney Elkins Hutton, the Director of Passive Investing Education here at PassiveInvesting.com. Guys, before we dive in, I just want to introduce our special guest here today, Aaron Hudson. Aaron, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I am so excited to be here and I hope to add extreme value to your listeners today. Thanks so much for having me, Whitney. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So before we start talking about the meal 240 unit complex in Houston, Texas, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into multifamily investing and where you're at today. Awesome. I absolutely will. So I am first and foremost, a mom of five beautiful kids and I came uh, from Southern California. I was in private practice with uh, two wellness centers, 30 headaches. Oh wait, I mean, employees. Uh, that worked for, for me. And while I was in private practice, I started to acquire single family rental properties. And all of a sudden I found out, uh, well, I had acquired 26 rental properties in two years. And first and foremost, I got a taste of this, something called mailbox money. And at that point I was addicted and I wanted more. And so exploring, I found out about multifamily. And the truth is, I thought multifamily was just for the billionaires. And I certainly thought this girl could not be worthy and capable of owning and operating apartment buildings. And that is so far from the truth. And I think uh, furthermore, look, being in private practice, living in California, I was paying 50 cents of every dollar to Uncle Sam, which in turn was robbing my children of the empire that could be created. And so- it was when I found out about multifamily, I literally packed my bags and I moved to Texas in a very short amount of time, brought in other doctors into my practice. I became the director there and I went to town on uh, exploring, getting coached and moving into the multifamily sector. And my goodness, the only thing I wish is that I would have gotten started earlier. But listen, we're not going to waste time crying about that. It's all um, greatness, good, and excitement. And so I think just to sum that up real quick, um, I went from taking down my first apartment building in May of 2019. And then uh, let's just say shortly thereafter, I came together and Quattro Capital was formed. And together, my goodness. There is so much synergies and such a beautiful, harmonized work effort uh, with our team. And it's made it possible for us to purchase 27 apartment buildings together. Uh, currently, we've got, you know, 200 uh, million assets under management, and we are changing lives of the 2000 plus tenants that live in our apartment buildings. And it has been amazing. So I will pause because you can tell that I'm pretty passionate about what I get the pleasure of doing. Awesome. Well, it, and it's a story that we hear repeated over and over and over. But I mean, everybody coming from different walks of life. So I'm so um, interested to hear your story come through as we talk about the Emil 240 units in Houston, Texas. So let's dive in. How did you find this deal? I want to back up that timeline because you closed it in two, September, end of September 2022. But let's back it up. When did you find it? Yeah, so we closed on that December 27th of 2022. And it was been, it had been six months in the making. Uh, how we found that was uh, Quattro Capital is comprised of five partners, managing partners. And we like to work with other game-changing individuals that are really great at broker relationships and finding properties. Sometimes they're found within our company. And sometimes we have other folks that are bringing properties to us that we share the same common values, goals, and desires in life. And with that being said, we had one of those, call it uh, soldiers, find this property for us. And we went to work, did our due diligence on it. And it was an absolute hell yes. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So there, it wasn't, was it listed with the broker? Was it a pocket listing? Like, or was it? Oh, it how did they find it? think that you've got to find off market and it's so far from the truth. There is good deals to be had on market. So yes, this one actually was on market, Whitney. Okay. Mm -hmm. On market. So what kind of class of property is this? I know where it's located. So I know I have a good guess. So we were just talking before the show that 
I think uh, the te- the club that I learned how to play tennis at was just a stone's throw from there. Um, right. But anyways, yeah, tell us like what kind of um, class of property this is and what part of Houston it's in. Yeah, so this is in the northwest. It's northwest of downtown Houston, and it's about 12 miles south of the Woodlands. I feel like a lot of people know where the Woodlands is. It's in a real affluent area. It's, it's a submarket of Houston. And we're always looking at the income in the surrounding areas. And this area in particular had an 88,000 median income over a three mile radius. So we always want to make sure that we're moving into markets and areas where it's just starting to emerge and turn. And so in this particular area, um, this property was an A minus, and we're just looking to take it to an A. It's a 1999 build, 240 units, and there was a lot of upside to be had. And I'm really looking forward to digging in on it. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. And so tell me how you structured the deal. So you're looking at this property and you're just saying, okay, uh, you know, it's been brought to you and and you're just looking at, you're like, okay, this is kind of a good deal. What it, what potential did you see in it? What was the business plan? Sure. Sure. So I think there were a few different things that were going on. First of all, the loss to lease was at $250 a door. So Friends, multiply that times 240 units. In addition, there was a loss to lease of another $250, meaning if we go in and we do the CapEx budget, we're going to get another $250 rent bump. How did we feel so confident about that? How we felt confident is because we own another property, a 220 unit that is about five minutes from there. So we already had our property management in place. Now, understand that other property that we owned was a B caliber of property, not this A or A minus. So it was really important for our property managers to make sure that they too could buy in on our business plan and our metrics of our bumps for the loss to lease, as well as once we do our CapEx, right? And so that was really it. We just saw a lot of upside in regards to that. But not only that, there was something that was really, really pivotal. Now, this beautiful property, when you walk into the um, office and they have this beautiful amenity center and a business office for the tenants and an exercise area and this kitchenette area that was rather large for entertaining. But when you walked into this place, I think we all get a feel when you walk in, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether you're greeted with kindness, whether you're just kind of like another body walking in and you're here in this beautiful office. And you get approached with two individuals that are the managing leasing individuals in there. And it was not a warm fuzzy. Furthermore, in talking to them, it was like they didn't like their job. And let's be all, I'll be honest here. When you meet somebody of that caliber, how can you feel good as a tenant living there if you are just a piece of meat and not approached with kindness and love and acceptance and comfortability? So that to me, was a huge pivotal piece that I knew if we brought the right people in there that cared for our tenants the way we do, that alone would change the whole feel of that particular property. And I've got stories that I can throw in to, sh- to confirm even more of that shortly here. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, get, we'll, 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 we'll get to those stories as we move through the due diligence piece. But just, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, raising rents as part of the you know, way to increase NOI all the time on buildings, but just for context, you know, I just did the quick math. I pulled up my calculator. So if you're watching on video, you might've saw my head drop a little bit, you know, $200 times 240 units divided. Let's just, I just threw in that it was a four cap. That's like $1.2 million. That's a lot of money just right off the bat. Even if you just raise the rents and if you're providing amazing customer service, it sounds like you, you have good justification to do that there. So let's talk about how did you get to the offer? So this is an on-market deal. Were you guys competing against other um, buyers? How did you get to, to your offer to be accepted? That's fantastic. I think there was six other offers on this property and we truthfully did not think we were gonna win this deal whatsoever. Um, we did end up winning the deal and I'll share the, the numbers with you, but basically we had won the deal at $42 million. We all know what happened last year, mid-year. What happened? The interest rates went up. And in order to do good business, not just for us, but also for our investors and be able to hit those return metrics, there was no way in heck with that right rent, I'm sorry, with that rate hike that we could still hit our projections. 
So we had to go back and retrade, which we have never been known for doing that on all of the other 27 properties we've purchased. We just don't do the retrade. It's a, you get a bad rap for doing that. Uh, but we came back to them and we got to find out what their pain points were. And truthfully, they didn't want to let the cat out of the bag on that. So we didn't know. What we did know is we had a half million dollars on the line that we could have already lost because we were coming back to retrade. So now it was a matter of time that we say, look, we will pay $38 million for this. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. We'll part ways and, and, and so on and so forth. And it was a waiting game of sheer silence for two weeks, right? Until they could give us a response. And finally they came back. So we found out their pain point was that they needed to sell. They had investors that they needed to make whole and they knew that they better take it now before any it gets any worse, right? So we ended up getting that for $38 uh, million versus the 42 million. Okay, so you put it, so you did have it under contract of 42. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's talk about that point. I wanna figure, I wanna, wanna understand how did you beat out the other six buyers to get it under contract? What did you put in there? How did you structure it? What was your plan? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, um. I think first and foremost, your brokers are either going to be your advocates or they're just not a fan of you. And they're going to be a mouthpiece for you. And they're going to speak from the mountaintop as to what our history is and how many deals we've taken across the finish line. And do we have anything else in the area? Are we local? All of those things matter. And then we painted a pretty picture with a... Um, a PowerPoint presentation about us and why we would be the right fit. And then furthermore, it went down to interviews. So we had interviews with the actual owners of the property and they interviewed a couple other individual or other firms as well. And we ended up making it. We were shocked to be quite honest because there are other people that were willing to pay more money than us. Ah, right? well, let's talk about, okay. So obviously the track record competence you know, the way you present yourself is, is, is huge, right? You know, even as a passive investor, you know, we're looking to invest with the operator first and foremost, and, you know, a seller is looking, looking to, you know, for somebody to close on the deal, who's going to perform, but what, 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 so you, you offer $42 million, but I'm curious to understand, did you, you know, you know, what did you put down for earnest money? How long did you, you know, have your due diligence period? Did you waive anything in there in order to make it more competitive? Sure. So we started at a half million dollars and then we ended up having to increase that to a million dollars over time. We had to increase that to a million dollars. And then <laughs> when the rates went up, we had to be okay with the fact that we might lose Quattro Capital, not any investors. Quattro Capital put their own million dollars on the line. And we had a come to Jesus moment where we said, you know what? These numbers no longer pencil. We have to be okay and come together as a team that we have to be all right with walking and being at a million dollar loss. It never feels good, but here's what I will tell you. When you do the right thing for your investors and don't try and take something on because you don't want to be at a loss, you are blessed infinitely for that, right? And so it came back in our favor and thank goodness we didn't lose a million dollars, but we thought we had lost a million dollars, truly. Ooh, okay. Well, all right. Let, so let's talk about the due, due diligence. Let's get into the nitty gritty inspections, appraisals, that whole thing. How, how much time did you have for due diligence and how much time did you have to close the property? Yeah, we had 30 days for our due diligence mm -hmm. and it was all together. It ended up being 90 days to close that property. So we had a good amount of time. It was just in that 90 days, so many different things happened. It was like riding a roller coaster. Oh, I'm right? sure. I'm sure. Like sleepless well, nights and all, and, and a little bit of fear and a little bit of scare, right? And a whole lot of prayers. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, you know, I, I'll, I'll break up the due diligence, um, you know, because I want to make sure we're touching on all those stories. You know, let's break it up in physical due diligence, financial due diligence. And I have a it, I, and I have a feeling the financial due diligence is where we're going to find the scary stuff. Yep. Um, but what, let's talk about, uh, you know, the physical due diligence, you put it under contract. How quickly were you on the property, um, walking the property? Did you walk every unit? What did you uncover? What were some of the, the skeletons in the closet? Sure. <laughs> so we completed our due diligence within 15 days. Um, once it was under contract, we went pretty hog wild. We run a really, really tight ship with our property management company, which they're used to an institutional property management company, and they're used to CapEx uh, 
projects that are pretty intense like this one, um, there wasn't a lot that we uncovered there, meaning, meaning that half the units had already been rehabbed, the other half were going to need the full renovation per se on that. But we just noticed that the uh, tenant base, the residents there, were just super dishonoring. There definitely needed a change up on uh, the residents. But I think a lot of that fell from what was happening in that front office. And I would love to share a quick little story what I mean by that. So for example, when we were walking the property, I noticed this beautiful asset and there was piles of trash sitting at the trash dump, at the dumpster. And I'm like, why would there be this kind of junk sitting at this beautiful property? And so what happened was I said to the leasing agent, ma'am, why is it that there is that much trash sitting around the property? And she goes, oh, because the, the trash bins are full. So of course, as I'm walking the property, what did I do? I open up the trash lid. I look in, there's nothing in there. So I go back to the lady after walking and I said, hey, just, just to let you know, there's no trash in there and there's trash out. So she walks over there and looks. There's a gentleman that comes to take his trash out. He looks um, at the trash bin. He drops it right next to the trash bin. The leasing agent says, hey, sir, doesn't know his name, number one, <laughs> says, hey, sir, pick up your trash and put it in the trash bin. He looks at her, looks away, and walks off. So there was no respect, and respect is given both ways, right? And so clearly there was no respect that there, these people didn't get any warm and fuzzy. And that's all part of it. Your residents need to be treated. This is not their house. This is their home. And they needed to be treated. Everybody deserves to be treated with kindness and appreciated and love and respect. And it clearly was missing from this property. You could feel it from when you walked in. Whitney. So that was what I meant. Like at, at due diligence, we really found a lot of that, but there wasn't anything that was striking that came up in particular on the due diligence walk. Mm, awesome. So mostly kind of more the subjective part of, you know, how could you increase the value on the Correct. asset? So, okay. You know, uh, no ruse doesn't sound like any ruse, galvanized piping, but cracked foundations. So let's talk about the financial due diligence. You know, obviously you put this under contract at $42 million at one interest rate, or at least kind of penciling out one interest rate, uh, you know, um, projection. And then, you know, a few months later, <laughs> you got a very different scenario. So kind of walk us through those, you know, some of those roller coasters of what happened. Sure. So we had a little mix of a couple things. Obviously the rates were going up, but here's what we found out. We received the rent roll and we had uh, tenants that were in there and it showed that uh, they had paid. Some were showing that they were late on pay, so on and so forth. We asked for an updated rent roll. I think it was three weeks later. And the um, leasing agent sent us over the rent roll. And all of a sudden we could see that there were 30 units that were vacant. Whereas before it showed that there was income coming in for them. And then the real true rent roll show vacancies of 30 units. So of course, we went back to try to retrade this had to do with it. And we were a little bit like, look, um, y'all are not up to snuff on this. And this is like legal, like anyways, financial fraud, whatever you want to call it, right? Because of who we bought from and they were a big company, they pretty much just flicked us off. Like either you want this or you don't want it, right? They would not own up to the uh, fraud that was the difference between these two rent rolls, right? They didn't want to own so it. You up. were presented with one set of financials when you uh, a contract, and then you were presented with the real financials that, yes, yes, yes. The, the, uh, that showed a gross reduction in the net operating income. Oh, massively. And we were already at 85% occupancy at this particular property, right? And so with that being said, uh, we started to panic a wee bit. But then guess what? You always have to be solution driven, right? Solution driven. And so what we did is we had a rallied our property management company and we said, look, we can either get upset and really get nowhere because we're up against this big company, or we can figure out a game plan and a strategy how we can use this to our benefit. So what happened is fast forward, we ended up day one, we had all our ducks in a row with what needed to take place, what was the materials that was needed for each of those units and what the labor costs were. And literally day one, we came in and we just blitzed through all 30 of those units. And we were able to get them done within that six month or six week timeframe 
on those 30 units and we were able to fill them. So it ended up being more advantageous for us to have that blitz versus trying to get people out and, and so on and so forth. So it ended up being a good thing, but it was a shocker. And we're like, oh no, what are we going to do now? And it ended up being favorable. Well, so you have this kind of issue that creeps up on the financial deal diligence. And now we've got the, 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 you're trying to secure financing on the deal. I'm curious to understand how did that impact your financing on the deal? Interest rates aside. Yeah. So we had to present with them our whole PDF game plan of what we were going to do, how we were going to blitz these and how it was going to be favorable. It was almost like talking them into how this is going to be more advantageous for the lender than it was prior. Right. And that's did what they we- know though that this had happened. Cause I'm curious, you know, did you present it one way and then you go, but by the way, it actually looked yeah. like this. We did, but listen, with Quattro, you're going to get full transparency. We're going to be totally honest and it's either going to move in the right direction for us and we're going to show our solution to solve this problem and how it's going to be more advantageous for the lender and more comfortability. And it did just that. Um, So that's really what happened there with those financials. But let's talk about what happened, Whitney, um, with the lender. So we had three different lenders in particular that we had vetted out and we decided that we were going to go with one of them. Um, And let's just put it this way. We were 12 days from closing and all of a sudden their rent or rates go up and the lender pulled out on our deal 12 days from closing. Not only did they pull out on our deal, everything that was in their pipeline, they stopped, froze everything and said, we're done. We're not doing it. So of course, we had a little bit of panic going on and we ended up going down to our second lender of choice. We did end up moving forward with that second lender, but there was a whole nother array of things that <laughs> it was like a snowball effect of things that unfolded from that having to do that, that pivot. Yes, we were able to use a lot of the same reports, so that helped to make it more speedy, but let's just say this much. It went from 75% LTV loan to value down to 65% loan to value. It took our 17, I'm sorry, it took our $14 million raise to $17.2 million raise. And we needed to have this puppy closed in 15 days. So you can imagine the stress and the pressure, right? And so with that being said, I kind of shot myself in the foot as well because I had this beautiful game plan for Quattro. And I said, listen, with the first, you know, the first lender and where we were, I said, I've got a really great idea. I said, this is a really beautiful property. And most of everything that we've done on all of the asset purchases prior to this had been 506B, retail investors, non-accredited. And for those of you that are familiar, you can flop from a 506B to a 506C. You have, a, you have to have a little window of not accepting funds, 24 hours or something. So I literally had a half million dollars left and I was going to flop it over to a 506C. That way we could take this beautiful property in this phenomenal area and get the exposure and put it all out on social media across all of the five teammates, platforms, and so on and so forth. Well, let's just say it was an absolute backfire because remember that 500,000 now went to 4 million of accredited investors funds in a 15 day time frame. So oh, you thought when you made the switch, it was before you understood that your LTV was going to go from 75 to 65. Yes, ma'am. Woo! <laughs> that, that would keep you, keep you up at night. <laughs> Yes. So anyways, listen, I think the the net of it is that we ended up, uh, we were a million dollars short. Uh, Quattro came in, brought their own million dollars as well as whatever else that they had invested in that and just to get it across the finish line. And so anyhow, that's really how that all unfolded. It ended up being advantageous at the end. And, and listen, 65% LTV gives more comfortability for our investors and so on and so forth. So we did make it happen. well so let's talk about the actual numbers on the loan so 65 percent ltv um what was it what did you lock did you is it a fixed rate floating rate you know tell us about those type of terms prepayment penalties yield maintenance stuff like that awesome so we have got a floating rate not to exceed 6.8 percent which is great we've got interest only for the full five years it's a three-year loan with a plus one plus one on that. Um, and what was your other question? I want to make sure that I hit this. Uh, 
Well, so it sounds like it's a bridge loan. So, yep. I mean, I guess it might make my next questions null, but is there any sort of prepayment penalty or lockout period on it? Yeah, you know what? I do not know what the prepayment, there is yield maintenance and I don't know what that is. So I apologize. No worries, no worries. But yeah, so a little bit of yield maintenance, but it sounds like, you know, with bridge debt, generally there's not, there might be like a, is there like a 12 month lockout period on the bridge debt or something like that? Yep. That's exactly it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you raised, uh, you know, you went what from 14 million to 17.2 million, um, capital raising, you know, walk to uh, walk us through the returns on this. Like what, it, what kind of structure did you offer your investors? Sure. So it's a preferred 6%. Um, and this is a cash on cash of 18 to 20%, uh, 16% IRR. And so obviously our game plan is to hold for five years and sell unless we hit our business plan earlier. Uh, we certainly can do that as well. We always like to leave room too, though, right? Like our, our game plan is five years. If we hit it early, great. Then it's going to become a three year. And if we need to hold it a little bit longer, perhaps a seven year, but five okay. years, that's our sweet spot. All right. And then were there any other tranches in the deal or just one tranche? Did you have any other IRR hurdles baked into the structure? Yeah, so we do. So basically when we hit that 16% IRR, it drops down to the 50-50. When we hit the 13% IRR, it's 60-40 split and it started off as a 70-30. So our goal is to is to really make sure that we exceed the expectations of the investor and I think also when we're talking to our investors, you know, we don't get pushback on our hurdle because if we get them that 18 to 20% and now it flops over to a 50-50, They've won, right? And we really don't win until it does have that little flop, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, it was funny. I was, uh, you know, uh, speaking on a podcast the other day, and um, I was trying to come up with a quick analogy. Somebody was like, you know, it may, when you talk about an IRR hurdle and how the GP gets paid, come up with an analogy. And, I, and the, the quickest thing that I could think of was like, it's like the GP is working for tips. I yeah. buy. <laughs> Everybody gets to eat at the table first. <laughs> You know, the GP does have some, you know, base fees, like with acquisition fee, asset management. And I want to talk about the fees here in a second, but really they're working for the large tip at the end. And, you know, you know, like, you know, if you go to a really fine dining restaurant, that tip can be really big. So <laughs> but we also like to educate on all that it entails to take down exactly. a property and vet it. And this being six months in the works, right? And driving out there and vetting out and getting the what the cost is on the rehabs and there's just so much right and it goes over and dealing with the lender, <laughs> yeah, dealing with the lender and staying sleepless nights right and then furthermore then going and operating that property and making sure that we hit our metrics for our business plan and and checking our variance reports and our construction budgets and there's so much more and it's I really just feel like it's super important that we really go into detail with our investors and they really truly understand because at the end of the day, the properties are beautiful, right? But they should not be investing based on a property. It really goes back to the operator and the experience of the operator. And if they've had great success about going full cycle and getting great returns for their investors. And so I always tell people the track record is really, really important, but even furthermore, go to the website, learn about the team, see if you get a great gut fill and they're of caliber of a team that you would want to link arms with, right? So there's just super important, crucial parts before you decide to invest just in any haphazard deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a lot of work to be done um, sure. that I think, you know, sometimes doesn't, isn't as, as visualized or as transparent to, to the investor. Um, so tell us a little bit about the, the fees that you presented to your LP in this deal. Yeah, so um, I think first and foremost, everyone always wants to know what's the acquisition fee and you hear people charging 5% of the acquisition fee to 2%, right? And so for us, um, we had a 2% acquisition fee on this one. And I will say that our acquisition fees, if it's less than 10 million, usually we'll have that 5% um, fee in there. It just has to make sense. And we're still have to be able to give the numbers and the returns first and foremost. And so I will say we don't get pushback on our acquisition fees at all, but it's because we also share with them all of what it entails. Right. And we're working in the best interest of them and hitting those, those metrics and so forth. So, mm -hmm. and then on that one, I think we have a, 
1% disposition fee when we go to exit out and sell, right? Any so, asset management fee? Yeah, 2% on the asset management fee. And uh, what was the other thing I was going to share? Fire away. I lost my train of thought, sister. <laughs> Oh, well, I have another question before we kind of move to wrap up. Um, you said with Quattro on this particular deal, you guys brought in five partners. So how did you guys structure, how do you structure the GP side of things? That's awesome. So when I say five partners, Quattro Capital is made up of five partners. And so we're always raising money from in-house, from our team, Quattro Capital. Um, with that being said, the only other way that we would bring in other individuals to take down a property is for this example, in particular, Stacy Buck, a dear friend of mine is the one that found this property. So she came in as part of the GP and got a little portion of that. And then there's another uh, equity group that we work with. And so she brought in a portion there and will come in as the GP and she's done a few deals with us as well. So usually there's one or two other, uh, call it companies that will come in um, but with that being said, Quattro Capital is the one that asset manages it, oversight, and has pretty much their hand in everything. Now, I will say there is one way that we break down the piece of what does that look like for each of those three parties on the earning powers and what position and percentage of ownership do they really have? We are very much abundance mindset. We don't, we're not scarcity and we got to have it all for ourselves. We think not, we're not transactional. We want to do multiple business. Uh, multiple times with these individuals. Hence, these are both great examples. This Stacy Buck that found this deal for us, this was her third property that she had found for us. The other gal, Sarah, she's come and joined forces with us on at least seven of our properties and have, has come in to fill maybe at least 25% of that capital raise. Everything else is going to come from in-house uh, between our team. With that being said, um, together, oh, what I was going to touch on is so how do you break down who gets what? And I feel like that's always the question of how do you break that down? I don't know if you've heard of something called uh, an Archi matrix or a Racy chart or any of that, but it basically- Racy, for sure, yep. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Now you're speaking the language. So basically what we do is we put that in front of those two partners and especially the one that found the deal. We always want to give, we want to be honoring, right? They found the deal. What lane do they want to play with and where do they see themselves fitting in? And we let them give first shot at it on what they want to do for the property. And then um, obviously everything else is filled in by what does Quattro want to do and where we need, where we're missing, if anything at all. So I'd like to say that of the GP side, usually Quattro will come in and fulfill anywhere from 60 to 75% of that GP structure for the most part. Mm, awesome. Awesome. Okay. So let's wrap up here. What, what did you find easy or what did you find that was easy during this process that you thought was going to be more challenging? What did I find? And what did you find? What did you find that was hard that you thought was going to be harder that you actually thought found to be easier? Um, gosh, well, how about if we do the flop? And let's go with the opposite first. I didn't, there's nothing that I can think of that would be, that, that I can think of off the top of my head that I thought would be hard and ended up being easy. I think if anything, I would say probably the amount of uh, being able to fill those 30 units fast. I thought it would take a lot more time to do the construction on them because we've done so many CapEx projects, right? But because we you know, after 27 deals, you figure out what you need to do to make things super efficient and effective. And it's kind of a little bit embarrassing that it took us 27 deals to really dial and nail this sucker the way we did. But because of the pressure we were put under, we had to get a game plan in place. And so now from going forward, we know exactly we're, we're always going to take the negative and turn it into positive. How can we get better moving forward? So now we know, regardless whether it's that situation or not, whatever is vacant, day one, we want to get our teams in there because all it's all about the bottom line. And if we can bring those funds in quicker, it's only going to enhance and make the property better. So that would probably be my one thing that ended up being easier than I had planned. And I think the one thing that was hard, harder than I thought, was the fact on this raise. Only because it is such this beautiful property that I thought everybody would be throwing their dollars all over the place. And it wasn't so much like that. I feel like for a couple of reasons, 
We have a lot of 506B non-accredited investors because that's where our heart is at. We want to impact the masses that never thought it was possible to invest. And the 506C accredited um, was just a little bit more challenging for us. But I also think the, that those that are accredited investors are very much so following what's happening in our market and the temperature of it. And so some people are just sitting back on their laurels a little bit, just kind of watching how things are going to play out. So certainly it didn't help with the rate hikes and all that unfolded just in this last 12 months, right? It's been a disadvantage for us, but I'm glad to say that we've got it done and moving on to bigger and better for sure, Whitney. Awesome. Well, Erin, thank you so much for sharing your experience and knowledge here with us today. If listeners want to find out more about you, how can you... So sorry, can we redo that one more time? Uh, oh yeah, it's not going to be edited. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> That's okay. It's totally it's fine. You guys, problem. you know, we try our best <laughs> to do these podcasts, but yeah, you know, we're all like working in environments from home. Um, you know, before we hopped on recording, Aaron and I, I was like, Aaron, hold on. I got to go take care of one thing. And yeah, anyways. So that said, Aaron, I totally get it. You had your puppy friend in the background let you know that it was time for us to wrap up. Um, <laughs> how can people best get a hold of you if they want to reach out? Fantastic. So two ways. First of all, you can go to the quattroway.com and quattro is with two T's, www.thequattroway.com. I would love for you to learn about our team. And furthermore, you can click on contacts and you can jump on a calendar on my calendar and we can have a 15 minute strategy call. Always love talking shop, love adding value to individuals, because the truth is, if I can help you get what you want, I'm already blessed and I get what I want. So that's number one. Number two is I'm all over social media, as is my team. So certainly friend me, connect with me on LinkedIn, and I would love to add value and help you win at the game of life. So happy to connect. Awesome. Aaron, again, thank you so much for sharing your time with us here today. And we look forward to hearing about future deals. Awesome. Have a great day, Whitney.